My name is Kim Brunhuber from CBC The National. It's a pleasure for me to uh, come from Toronto to be with you here today. And well, it's a pleasure anytime I get to, to leave Toronto, to be honest. Uh, but especially to be here today because, first of all, uh, Carlton is my alma mater. I was a uh, Carlton U. Yes. Not, not very often I hear applause whenever I mention that I'm from Carleton, so that's uh, good to hear. Uh, both a Master and a Bachelor of Journalism here at Carleton University, so it's great for me to be back. No, 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 plus, thank you. I, but I appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, but, it. But especially because I get to be here for this particular event, to be the MC, uh, to, to uh, present to you this Reed Institute initiative, which means Research, Education, Accessibility, and Design and uh, to join with you especially, this is a, an honor for me as well, to um, celebrate an extraordinary Canadian, Rick Hansen, as we get to uh, join here and, and celebrate this uh, 25th anniversary of his Man in Motion world tour. And it just as an aside for me, as I say, it's a, it's a pleasure especially to come back because uh, I remember when I was a student here, uh, you know, not all that long ago, and uh, you know, covering these types of issues for those uh, venerable journalistic institutions, uh, you know, the Centertown News, uh, CU TV News, the Charlatan, uh, about accessibility issues and, and uh, resources for people with disabilities. And it's amazing to come back and see how much uh, we've progressed since those days. So that's why I'm saying it's, it was, uh, I, I had to accept this invitation to be here today to join you guys, and I'm, I'm really thrilled. So, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our, our first speaker here today is the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs at Carleton University, Dr. André Plourde, the member of Carleton's senior management team responsible for mentoring the Reed Initiative. So, please welcome Dr. André Plourde. Well, we should have applauded the programs in journalism. They're fabulous. We have to keep reminding. Thank you very much for this. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here with you this afternoon. On behalf of the Faculty of Public Affairs, on behalf of my fellow deans across campus, I would like to welcome you to Carleton, welcome you to this celebration, because indeed this is a celebration. And I was, as I was thinking about what I should be talking to you for these few minutes, I was reminding myself where, where I was 25 years ago. As much as I hate to say this, I was actually working. Uh, it was my first academic job at another Canadian institution, where we were in this maze of little buildings and with no access to any kind of people with any kind of difficulty moving, little narrow staircases, little narrow doors to get into the rooms, little narrow hallways. And if we had students with disability, we had to make an appointment to see them at another place on campus where there was accessibility. We've come a long way in 25 years, but there's still a lot of work to do. And therefore, this is the second bit of the celebration, to discuss with you this initiative of the Reed Institute. This is a project that is led by academics across at least three faculties here at, at Carleton, mine in public affairs, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and the Faculty of Engineering and Design, and of course, the staff of the Paul Menton Center. It is, I want to highlight here now, this is one of the wonderful characteristics of Carleton as an institution of post-secondary education. We used to think of these things as siloed. We think of only those problems in this area, but notice how, how wide the, re the reach is for the people who are contributing to this institute, bringing all kinds of different perspectives. We'll address issues from all kinds of different ways. This is a strength of this institution. We should be proud of it. We should celebrate that the Reed Institute is built on these bases. This is indeed a great opportunity to make a real difference here at Carleton and in the communities that we are part of. It'll make a difference here in terms of practices and the way we run things here at Carleton. It has the potential to provide fabulous learning opportunities for all of our students, research opportunities for students and faculty members, 
and, he, and partnerships with community organizations of which many of you are representing. So we want to hear from you what your reactions, what your thoughts are, what your suggestions as we move forward with, ex with this exciting in innovation. So you've heard enough from me. I would like now to turn it over to the members of the panel so that they can bring to you examples of the great things that are happening here at Carleton. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Plourde. And uh, as you mentioned, they're hoping that this Reed Institute concept uh, will highlight uh, Carleton's already significant role in the field of disability. So now you get to sit back and, and uh, all the panelists are going to do the work here. You're going to hear for four, from uh, four presentations they are going to uh, share with you the potential of the Reed Institute. And uh, as uh, Dr. Plourde said, you, you, you will likely have questions and maybe have feedback and so on. So we want to um, encourage you to do that, but just hold it until um, the end. And actually, once those presentations are complete, we're going to have a, a town hall style meeting uh, which, in which uh, you know, we will have a microphone. You'll be able to uh, interact with all of the panelists. So that'll be uh, fascinating to, to hear your feedback as well. So we want to start off with our first presenter, uh, Nathan Hauk having completed both a Bachelor and Master of Arts degrees in Political Science here at Carleton. Nathan is currently coordinating the Spinal Cord Solutions Network in Ottawa for the Canadian Paraplegic Association. And over the summer, Nathan has been researching disability studies programs for the Reed Steering Committee, and he's here to give you an overview of his findings and uh, open a dialogue on Carleton's future disability studies program. So please welcome Nathan Houck. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. And uh, I would also just uh, preface my introduction by saying I am now back here at Carleton doing a graduate diploma in health policy while I'm working with CPA Ontario. That is, it's been such a fabulous institution. I couldn't stay away for too long, so it's lovely to be back here. So nice to see everyone. Um, I'm here today to talk to you briefly about disability studies and the potential contributions of the Reed Institute. And this is a project that I have worked on with Roy Haynes, who is a professor in the School of Social Work here at Carleton. We set out to ask a question, which is, within academia, is there a comprehensive interdisciplinary program that provides for a community-based, practice-oriented research framework concurrently focused on universal design, accessibility, and inclusion more broadly, which can include, of course, social policy, critical theory, and the like. Now, just to let people know, there are a number of institutions that offer different components of what we are proposing here, but as we will further discuss, nothing that really offers it in the comprehensive fashion that the Reed Institute proposes. So, by way of methodology, we examined over 40 programs within the English-speaking world and further evaluated 15 of those to see which offered full programs in disability studies, the degree of theoretical framework, that is, social, medical, and other models, and interdisciplinary approaches offered within them. Furthermore, we evaluated core programs at the following institutions. Within Canada, we have University of Manitoba, Ryerson, Windsor, and York. Within the United States, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, the University of Illinois, Chicago, Maine, and Syracuse. Within Great Britain, there was a focus on Leeds. Lancaster is more sort of primarily a research institution in itself. Australia, we have Flinders and Newcastle universities. Ireland, the University College Cork. New Zealand, we have Auckland. And all the way over in South Africa, we have Cape Town. So by way of context, when we talk about the different models that we are investigating and we sort of placed into different catchments, we have the sort of broader medical model, which is focused primarily on curing disability or adapting individuals to external environments, that is, not engaging with the social construction of environments, that which may be by virtue of inaccessible design. So this is the sort of preceding model of disability is to be overcome and one must adapt to the external environment rather than looking at how we construct an environment which would include not only accessibility but the more universal design so it is as broadly inclusive as possible. Then we move to the social model which argues that disability is indeed socially constructed and may be fundamentally based in attitude and no barriers. And disability studies more broadly has a focus in this respect, so especially within liberal arts disciplines and its focus is more on comprehensive community integration. 
and this often includes an interdisciplinary framework. And I should emphasize that from a broader, more critical disability theory perspective, there are, of course, different models, but uh, we use a sort of broader approach for our purposes here today. So here are our findings, more, more generally. The vast majority of programs were indeed rooted in the social model of disability, with a wide breadth of course dev work devoted to critical theory. Two programs offered uh, program did, rooted in disability and jurisprudence, so disability in the law more broadly. And other, one other one was rooted in sort of broader social policy implications, and other more extensive programs provided specializations within these courses offered. So that would be more like PhD programs, such as the University of College, Illinois, that would have as broad a range as possible that people could utilize. And two of the programs, going back to the medical model of disability, uh, were identified, and one is based in rehabilitation and health sciences, the other one social work practice, but not from a critical theory perspective. So that is service provision in a medical context and moving forward from there. So where does this leave us today? The Reed Institute has established a steering committee to look at a curriculum development working group which includes professors, staff, and students which will be developing Carlton Disability Studies program and we will start with a minor and the first course is to be launched in 2012. And you'll be hearing more today about the different courses that we currently offer and how this will move forward as we go ahead. So here's the final analysis. There is no comparable program of the proposed Reed Institute. You will notice that our broader mandate is to enhance current program emphasis in areas of universal design and accessibility and inclusion more broadly, to support research design on, or to research, sorry, on disability in multiple disciplines and to promote their connection among various approaches, utilizing including universal design, critical disability theory, public policy, social sciences, and the humanities. And of course, within the community context, to enhance the engagement of ideas and interests between Carleton University, people with disabilities, and the broader community. And indeed, in the work that um, Professor Haynes and I uh, undertook, we did, in, find, in fact, find critical evidence of the fact that having such approaches and programs do, in fact, change university environments themselves, which further enables broader connections with the community and has what I would call the cascade effect to bring about further accessibility. So here's what the Reed Institute offers. Community orientation here in Ottawa a critical theory framework to provide as broad a scope as possible, and crucially, applied practice. And this is a piece where people are learning how to take what they've brought forward in the university context, in the classroom, concurrently into applied practice during their time here at the university. And so that is what the Reed Institute offers. And of course, if you should have any questions, you can ask them here today or contact Professor Haynes and myself at the address above. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Nathan, as you uh demonstrated there. The Reed uh, Institute uh, will be uh, truly one of its kind. Uh, so our next uh, presenters represent Carleton's School of Industrial Design. So I'm going to introduce Professor Bjarke Halgrimson with graduate students Christine Gowdy and Tim Hatz. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really here to introduce these two guys and their projects a little bit. Um, before that, um, I just thought I had um, a few minutes to talk a little bit about what is industrial design and also how uh, inclusive or universal design fits a little bit within uh, industrial design. So um, as you know, the uh, REED Institute, or REED stands for Research and Education Accessibility and Design. So in terms of design, industrial design is perhaps um, uh, somewhat of an unknown uh, field. Uh, it's sometimes called product design because that's probably closer to what we do. Um, we're quite fortunate to have a program in industrial design here at Carleton. In fact, even though it's uh, probably the smallest unit on campus, it's uh, one of the most unique and uh, the only one in a comprehensive university in Ontario. Um, so uh, what's special about uh, industrial design is that it's a real blend of art and science and technology, but there's a real focus on the end user. So um, within the field of industrial design, we often speak about universal or inclusive design as terms that you're, many of you are familiar with. And in terms of product design, it involves designing mainstream products and services to basically make them as accessible to and usable by a greater range of people without the need for special adaptation or specialization. This means that products surrounding our daily life 
are easy to use and operate regardless of physical or cognitive ability. In other words, think of redesigning the jam jar instead of designing another tool to open the jam jar. Um, what we've found is that whereas the end product may not end up costing anything more to produce, the reality is that companies do not necessarily buy into the upfront research that needs to happen into how to make sure that products affect more people. Other companies, on the other hand, for example, OXO Good Grips, have realized this potential and made a whole business out of it. So whereas um, we always aim to design mainstream products to be as universal as possible, at the same time, we need specialized equipment to be as well designed as possible to ensure accessibility. Uh, the pictures here show a range of student projects done within the school to enhance the accessibility of people to a range of sports. Um, many of these uh, fine projects were done in collaboration with the Canadian Paralympic Foundation. What you see here are projects that involved an intense examination of how the sports were played and how the equipment could be designed to be more user-friendly, less expensive, and hence more accessible. It is really important to work firsthand with the athletes while developing such products, as will be shown in a student presentation. Now, at the same time, what you can see here is that these are products, some of them are daily use products, like the kettle or the fire extinguisher. Now, these particular products were designed in collaboration with el elders that, or elderly seniors that actually helped in the design process uh, so that the products would just be easier to use by anybody. And at the same time, the objective there is that it's a mainstream product. I think what distinguishes this approach is how much time you spend and work with real end users up front when designing something. Um, I'd like to introduce the two speakers from our program, Mr. Tim Hotz and Ms. Ms. Christine Gowdy. They're both students in our graduate program. Um, but Tim is actually going to talk about a project he did in his fourth year while he was an undergraduate student, also in the industrial design program. And Christine Gowdy is currently researching wheelchair seating and pressure source in the context of her interdisciplinary master's thesis project. So on that note, please come. So as Bjarki has mentioned, I'm going to talk about my fourth year major project that I did last year in the undergraduate program. I designed an adjustable rugby wheelchair for the sport of wheelchair rugby. And if you're not familiar with the sport, I suggest Googling it when you get home tonight. Uh, but basically, it's a sport that was developed specifically for quadriplegics. Now, one of the key problems with uh, wheelchair rugby is that the, the wheelchairs themselves are completely fixed units and are highly customized specific for the needs of the, the user or the athlete, as well as for the sport. And these chairs can cost anywhere from $3,000 up to $10,000 and increasing from there. So there's a pretty price tag on these. So the solution that I came up with is an adjustable rugby wheelchair um, that is specific for quadriplegic athletes. It gives them the opportunity to play the sport while learning about their personal fit, the dimensions needed in order to accommodate their level of disability, um, their body type, as well as their performance. This wheelchair would not be purchased by the users themselves, but would rather be um, offered through a program such as Bridging the Gap or through the clubs such as the Ottawa Stingers Wheelchair Rugby Club. The key thing here is that the athletes can actually participate in the sport without having to purchase uh, a wheelchair. And for those who are more interested in actually competing at higher level elite performances, they can actually use this uh, wheelchair to learn about what they need when they go to buy their first competitive chair. So really, they're not spending $3,000, $4,000 on a chair to find out that it doesn't quit, fit quite right for them. The key thing here that I want to mention is that a huge part of my process and a part of the industrial design process is being involved with the end users. Once a week, if not twice a week, I was spending time with the Ottawa Wheelchair Rugby Club, um, the Ottawa Stingers. And I was there observing, talking to them, watching them play. I even got the chance to actually participate in the sport and get hands-on experience of what it's like to play the sport. 
as well as do various testing, uh, user testing and prototypes, as you can see in the middle picture on the right. So this is really important for uh, developing um, disability studies and moving forward in terms of inclusive design, is including the end user. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. So I'm going to pass it on to Christine now. My name is Christine Gowdy, and I'm a second year student in the Master of Design program here at Carleton. I came to Carleton last year with a background in medical product design, specifically in wheelchair seating. So through exploration of wheelchair seating materials and ergonomics, I began to really understand the secondary health concerns that were an issue for wheelchair users all over the world, and that is involved with extended periods of sitting. So here's a few prototypes that I developed in the early stages of my research. So the Master of Design program interested me because I wanted to dive deeper into the research behind some of these medical issues associated with wheelchair seating. So this interest has really shaped my research and my time here at Carleton. So I see design for disabilities as a very interdisciplinary area of study because it overlaps with so many other disciplines. And I'm really interested in this because to me it leaves a lot of room for future innovation, research and development. So since starting the program, I've had some pretty great opportunities uh, presented to me. And some of them are as simple as being able to take biomedical engineering courses as electives. Uh, that really lets me uh, facilitate my research and push it forward in terms of medical uh, background into what I'm doing. So another opportunity came last winter when I was asked to speak at Design and Daba. Now Design and Daba, for who uh, in the audience doesn't know, it's uh, an international conference and exhibition in Cape Town, South Africa. And their focus is on the future of creativity. And uh, when I was there, one of the emerging themes that came up at the conference was design for disabilities, which I found interesting. And Carleton was the only university uh, invited to represent Canada at this conference. So I was pretty proud to be there. So when I was there, I spoke about my research at the time, and it involved a lot of uh, study about wheelchair users in developing countries and the specific seating requirements that they uh, needed in such regions. So right now I'm currently writing my thesis and uh, it's focused on the transfer of knowledge between disciplines and that's hopefully to advance the future of design for disabilities. So here's a quote from the World Health Organization and uh, it's from the World Report on Disability, and I thought it really emphasized the need for more research in this area, and it really justifies what we're doing here in our program. And uh, it says, research is essential for increasing public understanding about disability issues, informing disability policy and programs, and efficiently allocating resources. In closing, on behalf of our department, the School of Industrial Design is committed to developing products, environments, and services that respect the diversity of all people and their abilities. We look forward to collaborating with the Reed Institute at Carleton University to identify challenges facing the disabled community on campus and in our larger communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was uh, fascinating to see those uh, concrete examples of interdisciplinary uh, research there. So our next guest is uh, Juja Grandpierre, who spent countless hours this summer doing research on research. Yeah, you heard me right. Currently working on her master's degree in educational counseling. Juja is a valued employee and volunteer at the Paul Menton Center here at uh, Carleton for Students with Disabilities. Please welcome Juja. So hi everybody. My name is Juja Grandpierre and my job was to uncover the wealth of uh, disability and accessibility research initiated at Carleton University. So in the next few minutes, you will learn how we conducted this research, the magnitude of the research that we have uncovered, and how this research spans across the five faculties. I also have the great pleasure to highlight to you one of the research projects. Our goal was to scope the extent, range, and nature of the disability research conducted by both students and professors at the university. At this stage of our research, we have looked at Carleton University's dissertation database and the work of thesis supervisors. 
We began our research by identifying both general and then specific terms, and then uh, such as learning disability and uh, dyslexia, and then we entered the general term first into the research database and uh, to identify the magnitude of uh, the coverage. Each hit was then evaluated against our inclusion criteria and selected study scope, uh, focus, methodology, results, and future recommendations, along with the name of the thesis supervisor, was entered into the database. We repeated the same process with the specific terms, and we also have looked at the work of thesis supervisors, and any relevant information that we have found was also entered into the database. Our research has uh, indicated that accessibility and disability have a strong history at Carleton University. Beyond the earlier mentioned presentation from the Industrial Design Department, in the past 20 years, over 80 students have completed their PhD and master thesis on topics related to disability or accessibility, and 30 of their supervisors have published over 160 articles on similar topics. As you can tell from these results, the education focused on accessibility and disability at Carleton University is not new, and the Reed Institute is merely shining a light on the, the ongoing research efforts. Now I'm going to give you some statistics. Our primary research has indicated that every faculty has uh, contributed to the volume of research in this area. The Faculty of Arts and Social Science have generated 15 PhDs, 23 master's theses, and 11 of the professors have published 30 articles on topics related to autism, Parkinson's disease, dyslexia, and spinal bifida. The Faculty of Engineering have uh, produced three PhDs, six master's theses, and nine professors have published 40 articles on uh, speech recognition or assisted living. The Faculty of Public Affairs turned out at least one PhD, 15 master theses, and five professors have published 28 articles related to general disability issues. The Faculty of Science published at least four PhD, two master's dissertations, while three professors have authored 60 articles on depression or Parkinson's disease. Finally, uh, from the Sprout School of Business, we have identified one PhD and two articles published by one professor. While I love to tell you about every one of this research, given uh, our time restrictions, uh, I'm only going to talk about one of this research. The three-year-old ABL laboratory is running under the direction of Professor Moshtaba Ahmedi. So Professor Ahmedi and his four PhD and five master's students are developing robotic solutions for new applications. Amongst other projects, they are studying the dynamics of walking with the help of robotics. They are also trying to develop advanced solutions at lower cost for rehabilitation clinics, and they are designing surgical uh, robotics in collaboration with local hospitals, rehabilitation centers, and Harvard University. I will tell you a little bit more about their research projects. Uh, these projects are related to rehabilitation robotics. The gate enabled is a robot designed to help stroke victims who have retained some control over their legs. This robot helps them learn to walk again, and it also protects them from losing their balance. The robot's behavior is then programmed by the physiotherapist, and the user can maneuver these machines with the help of a force controller. The virtual gait rehabilitation robot is designed for patients who did not retain any control over uh, their legs, and they need extensive uh, physiotherapy. The robot can help uh, provide a variety of exercises for long periods of time, and this allows physiotherapists to focus on uh, the process of rehabilitation rather than actually doing the physical, physical work. The wearable assisted devices are also called exoskeletons, and these robots can help people with paralysis to walk again, and it also protects them against muscular atrophy. A lighter version of this robot could also benefit uh, the growing elderly population in Canada. As you can tell from the work of this lab, their work is uh, incredibly important for people with uh, physical disabilities. And if you have any questions uh, later on, you can address it to Professor Ahmedi after the presentations. Uh, in my closing remark, i just like to reiterate that every one of Carleton's faculty have uh, contributed to the magnitude of this research.
Thank you very much. That was really cool, actually. I'd like to learn more about that, maybe do a story. If uh, I can make that pitch right now, Dr. Uh, Ahmadi. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting to see how much uh, scholarship and research has been generated uh, here at Carleton in the past, and I guess we can just expect that to increase with this uh, READ initiative uh, in the future. Uh, so that's great to see. So the final presentation uh, demonstrates, I guess, what, what they hope will be uh, the, the heart and soul of this uh, READ Institute, and that is uh, the solutions-based initiatives. And uh, representing his colleagues at Carleton's Technology Innovation Management Program, let's uh, please welcome Graduate student and entrepreneur, James Makienko. Okay, thank you, Kim. So as, uh, as he mentioned, I'm the grad student in Technology Innovations Management Program here at Carleton University. And, um, and I'm here to tell you a really cool story about how a challenge became an opportunity for us as students to apply our learning and actually solve the problem that's uh, related to disability. So basically what happened was that uh, this summer I got the call in our lab. We have this phone that sometimes rings, and when it rings, you want to respond, right? So uh, th in that case, it was our professor, Tony Boletti, who I don't see here, but uh, he's everywhere. <laughs> and basically when he calls, you want to answer. So I answered, and uh, me and about 10 of our colleagues came to the lab to meet, uh, to meet him uh, and uh, Dean and Larry from Paul Mendel and Sandra at Roosters. Right, and basically as the result of that meeting, I was volunteered to, <laughs> to lead the effort to basically provide some solutions where it comes to accessing uh, the video, videos that Carlton produces. So just like you see a sample lecture video with some uh, closed captioning there, and what they really wanted to do is to be able to close caption the content that uh, comes out of Carlton. So basically I'll just talk to you about the challenge for a sec here, and it can be described in one word, scalability. So right now, Carlton produces about uh, 30 to 40 hours of video a year on a very kind of request-based basis. So the challenge is to take it, to increase this number by 100 times, right, to ensure that all the content is closed captioned. Now, it also takes about uh, seven days or so for this request to come in and to get the captioned video out on the other end, which is, again, too much if you're talking about 3,000 hours. So we want to reduce it to about three days or less, if possible, so also, you know, when it comes to money, it, it gets expensive if you go out to an outside company and ask for a closed captioning service. It goes from $1 to $3 a minute, right? So on a minute scale, it's kind of small, but when you start talking about thousands of hours, you know, the accountants, you know, they throw books at you, right? And you just can't do it. So you have to do it with volunteers, and you have to do it in such a scalable way so you can get a lot of people involved and don't have a crazy headache over it. So... Basically, another thing that's uh, kind of happening parallel to this effort is the legislation by Ontario, you know, government that basically says that if you're a public institution at uh, 2013 onward, like for the next few years, you have to take measures to ensure that the content you produce is fully accessible, right? So, you know, Carlton has taken the lead here and we're going to beat the legislation deadlines and proposed timetables. And again, it's not because we just want to comply with some regulation, it's because we're doing what's right for the students. Right? And also, once we get it done, we want others to benefit as well. So we're going to make the solution open source available to other universities and institutions. Basically, the solution takes uh, everything from the, you, you have a video file, you, then what you do, you upload it, you separate the audio, then you run it through a speech-to-text recognition software, and it gives you about 60 to 80 percent accurate uh, transcript. But again, 60 to 80 percent when it comes to student, it's not good. We want the best for our students. I'm a student after all. So <laughs> we definitely want to get, it, get this number higher to 100 percent. And the way we do it, we just uh, get many hands, many editors to come in and collaborate on this video and go through it and fix the errors piece by piece, and I'll tell you about the pieces later. And after they've done that, they go and in a wiki-style fashion, they just look over each other's work to make sure that nobody put like any bad words there. After that, you have... Uh, a file that you can upload and play with the video and at the end of the day get the closed captioned video to, to the students. So 
basically this is how the, the wireframe looks for what happens whenever you go into the system and you click on the video that you want to subcaption. It divides it into a bunch of chunks and you can see next to the chunk that's being edited or finished the name of the author in that chunk and the available chunks you go in, you just click on one and, uh, and you can edit it. Basically what it does, it's three things for the students. It enables them to actually kind of go through the material that was taught in a different way and just uh, type it in and repeat it to themselves so it's better learning for them. It also helps them with their co-curricular re record because now they can say, well, I volunteered, I've captioned videos for, you know, for everybody else, right? And also it gives them at the end of the day, once they've done their chunks, it's the searchable transcript that again, they can go and read and uh, learn from it. So it helps better learning and it helps provide better accessibility, right? So what happens when you click on the chunk, basically, you go into this uh, page where it's further separated down to what actually happens on the screen, just like the caption I've seen on the, I've shown in the first slide. So you edit them one by one until you get to the end, you see your progress, right? So once you get to the end, you click next and it takes you to the previous screen and you can do another one if you wish. So basically that's the process at its core. Right now, we are pretty much about halfway down through development. We hope to get the prototype out by November-ish, November, December, and uh, then we'll dedicate the next uh, month to test it, to make sure it all works, fix all the errors, incorporate the feedback, and hopefully start uh, doing some actual Carlton content in around May or so of next year. Basically, that's it, and I think it's a great example to see how, how Carlton is so passionate about two things, accessibility and innovation. And here, it comes together. So I think it's a, it's a good example to see what a Reed Institute can do when you bring the two together and actually produce real solutions to real problems and allow students, all students, you know, to apply the learning that they have during the program in their stay at Carleton. Thank you very much. Oh, what a, a great example of uh, innovative problem solving there with implications, uh, obviously, that reach far beyond Carleton. Uh, so thanks so much, James. Uh, I want to uh, now bring back all the panelists, and then we're also uh, we're going to have your questions now. And uh, in addition to those panelists, we're going to bring uh, out another group as well. Uh, so I want to uh, introduce Dr. Rafik Gubran, the Dean of Carleton's Faculty of Engineering and Design, Larry McCloskey, the Director of the Paul Menton Center for Students with Disabilities, Erica Carson, a fourth-year Carleton undergrad, member of the Board of Citizens with Disabilities Ontario, and also a member of the Reed Institute Community Engagement Working Group. And finally, Edward Ndopu, human rights activist and international student. We heard a lot about uh, Cape Town today. Well, he's from Cape Town. I'd like to welcome him. Uh, and he's also a uh, human rights uh, activist, as I said, and uh, pursuing an undergraduate degree in educational justice and inclusion. So uh, the way this will work is just, uh, well, raise your hand, and then we'll send a microphone, uh, I believe, over to you, and then you can... Uh, ask a question and I'll just uh, also summarize the question uh, for those who uh, can't hear. I just have a comment to make. I think I'm amazed at the last presentation and how far we've come at Carleton since we couldn't get professors to even allow tape recording of their lectures. <laughs> so the accessibility that it, it's just amazing that you've managed to get it this far. So, more of a comment than a question, but uh, perhaps uh, we could have some of our panelists or uh, other people address that and, and sort of talk about what it has taken to get to this point and some of the other solutions perhaps that you're pursuing. Um, well, this is, uh, today's the culmination of about 20 years to uh, get to this point uh, of possibility. and. Um, so uh, it's been amazing uh, to see the, one of the things about Reed that has astonished uh, Dean Melway and I, and by the way, Dean did most of the work to organize today, um, has been that we've talked about this concept before and the time was not quite right, but we've been overwhelmed by how the response has been this time. The timing is right for so many reasons. Carleton is all there. There's legislation that requires us to do things. We have a whole group of people who are interested in providing the solutions. So. Everything about the concept becoming a reality seems to be falling into place this time, which really is making us pretty happy. 
Um, I would also just uh, want to reiterate part of what makes this uh, institute model so valuable to Carlton is given its expertise in the area of accessibility, particularly around the Palmetto Center, so I'll toot Larry's horn on that respect, but also um, the integrated attendance service program that we have here, the broader physical accessibility. Um, you know, this has been something that makes us all very proud and it gives us a culture from which to work and to carry it forward as well. Hi, my name is Sue Balmer, and I'm with the Rehabilitation Center of the Ottawa Hospital. And I was just wondering about your community partners and if you have any and who they are and how you plan on engaging them in the future, because I think that's going to be really important. Community engagement is really key with this, because um, as many of you probably know, in the disability community, we have a common slogan that's nothing about us without us. So it's really key to get those organizations to work with the Reed Institute. So um, the industrial design um, presentation was a great example of how to integrate the real lived experiences of people with disabilities and to use community consultation for that. So it's key. I want to raise something uh, uh, to the uh, Dean of Engineering, Dr. Gobran, because um, the pivotal moment for us was, Dean and I had talked about this, and, and Dr. Roy Haynes and uh, Professor Karen March, and there are disability programs out there, but what distinguishes what we're attempting to do is that these programs are human rights-based, which is great. They tend to be in the, in, the realm, in the faculties of arts and social science, but when we went to see the Dean of Engineering, he was very excited. He said, we have to do this, because what we were proposing is that we do a solution-based concept. 25 years ago, I had students in wheelchairs and we went to the Science and Technology Center and they would fix things on wheelchairs and do splints and things that at the time the rehab center and occupational therapist couldn't do. Louis Raffler, the director at that time, became so excited that he created, patented, and, di and distributed the dollar bill reader for people who are blind. So when we went to that meeting with the Dean of Engineering, he not only was excited, he pulled out a half dozen projects related to disability that he was doing, primary researcher. So this was an amazing moment for us. So uh, from the Faculty of Engineering and Design perspective, we see that we can provide comprehensive interdisciplinary solutions to uh, make our environment more accessible and more safe as well. But the key here is interdisciplinarity. Because again, the area of accessibility involves talking to the user, try to understand what the users need. There are so many products out there that are not user-centered designed, and as a result, when the users start using those products, they don't satisfy their needs. So trying to understand the needs of the users is number one, and then trying to pull in all of the expertise, and they're gonna tell you a little bit about the expertise we have at Carlton in this area in order to come up with that solution. But then that solution will never work unless we work with the community. We work with people from occupational therapy, from rehabilitation, from social work, from uh, physiotherapy, in terms of finding out exactly how would those devices work properly and how can we make our environment more accessible. But also comes the policy and regulations because again, without that, the whole equation is not solved. So it's very important to involve policy, regulation, also people from psychology to understand how, how others would react to those ideas and concepts and approaches, and finally the business and entrepreneurship in order to make those actually available to everybody. So let me talk a little bit about the universal inclusive design. So our uh, Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism and our School of Industrial Design are working in order to design systems and design interfaces that are suitable and appropriate to the various users. Uh, we use the user-centered design in order to design any new product or any new concept. 
our engineering uh, researchers are actually working on the next generation of systems, devices, and approaches that can actually accommodate people with disability, in particular those who have any mobility impairments. We have another group working on visual impaired people or hearing impaired people to design the new generation of hearing aids and also to design our working place and our environment in a way that can accommodate people with uh, uh, disability and make it more accessible to all of us, not just design it for a certain group. So we have also lots of people working on the next generation of sensors. There are so many sensors out there that can be used to make our life easy and to simplify our daily living activity. And uh, as you saw, there are examples from researchers teaming together from biomedical engineering, from mechanical engineering, from electrical engineering, from computer engineering, from sensors, in order to come up with the new generation of devices as we saw wheelchairs, walkers, and others. I wanted to mention uh, one aspect of uh, what we hope Reed can do, and that is uh, do something for persons with disabilities internationally. And we have a student here who is very well qualified to speak to that, uh, Mr. Edward Nadopu. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, well, from the vantage point of an international activist, I can say with conviction that um, we've institutionalized the bare minimum as the yardstick of um, achievement for accessibility. Um, and having spoken at various forums, like the World Economic Forum, um, I can say that global leaders um, have renegated disability sort of to the outskirts of the discourse. And Certainly what's happening here is really cool because I think that this is a platform upon which to strengthen uh, the discourse on disability and shift it from disability rights to anti-ableism and recognizing the difference. So taking away the onus from the individual and looking at the individual in relation to the environment and society. Um, and certainly I think that this will provide impetus for recognizing that people with disabilities constitute the world's largest minority group, about 750 million people. So I think it's about time that we look at disability from a global north and a global south perspective um, and begin to sort of drive the movement forward. Um, so as an international student with a disability here at Carlton, I'm really excited um, to engage in the process of of taking the discourse um, to other parts of the world. So yeah, it's exciting. Hi, my name is Christine Kelly. I'm a PhD student here at Carleton. Um, I loved hearing the references to human rights from Edward and to critical theory from Nathan. And I'm wondering if the School of Industrial Design and, and Engineering has thought about how you might engage with those uh, streams of disability studies uh, as we move forward with the Reed Institute. I think that's a very interesting question. Um, a few times we mentioned about the nature of interdisciplinary studies. And for example, from the point of view of industrial design, in the graduate program, we have a, um, a program where um, students would actually be co-advised by somebody in another faculty, where they could actually look at uh, design from this perspective. So that's how we currently view it. It has to be interdisciplinary. And that's really the only way you're going to get these uh, different viewpoints and, and, and a better solution, ultimately. Another important factor to, consideration, to consider, um, in addition to uh, an interdisciplinary approach, is looking at intersectionality. So looking at disability in the context of uh, race, gender, and class, because of course, then we need to acknowledge that the majority of people living with disabilities reside in the global south, about 80%. Um, so we need to look at poverty as a contributing factor and the socioeconomic status of people with disabilities. Um, and, and sort of looking at the Reed Institute as, um, uh, as uh, an opportunity to, for, for people with disabilities to actually uh, deconstruct some of these barriers um, that exist once we enter into the world of work 
for example, um, and the pace of work, um, even here at Carlton, is predisposed to able-bodiedness. Um, and you know, those are some of the factors that I personally would really like to um, see taken into consideration. So I just thought I'd plug that in. At the School of Industrial Design, accessibility is not just about disability, but also accessibility, clean water, that sorts of things. You spoke about poverty and such. There's actually projects that we do in the School of Industrial Design where we actually go to places like uh, Haiti, I think, or um, what was it, Chile. We went to Chile. Um, this, there was a student group population that went to Chile and actually did user research in Chile to design products for them in uh, disaster relief uh, with the recent earthquake. So I don't want to talk about it too much, but basically the Indo School of Industrial Design is actually doing uh, global, dealing with global problems and we're still making the effort to go down to these places or wherever it is in the world to actually be with those users and actually do the research and develop products that are appropriate for them. Well, thank you very much. I know there are more questions. I certainly have my own questions, but we'll have to hold those till uh, afterwards when I'm sure uh, we'll be able to gather with our panelists and, and chat with them. I uh, want to thank you for participating and contributing to this discussion, and uh, hopefully you'll continue to uh, follow the developments of uh, the Reed Institute. As